Mr. Well, we are in Obadiah, and uh, wow, oh wow, what a book about not melted chocolate. <laughs> um, yeah, that's probably my favorite thing about the book of Obadiah is that it's not about melted chocolate. Um, so we've looked at Obadiah 1 and the, the background to the book, and uh, then last week uh, we started getting into where is making the transition to Obadiah chapter, er, verse 2. Sorry, there is no, there are no chapters in Obadiah. So here's once again the structure of the book. Um, the introduction is in verse 1. The judgment comes before the charge. So verses 2 through 10, we're going to look through two through, at 2 through 9 tonight. And that's just going to look at the um, at the judgment of Edom. And then after he, he gives the judgment, then he brings the charge in verses 11 through 14. And then he has the bad good news in 15 through 18. And then the good good news in 19 through 21. So let's get started here. Um, I'll read through this section, and before we get going, I'll actually start in verse 1. The vision of Obadiah, this is what the Lord God says concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Rise, and let's go up against her for battle. Or, Rise up, yes, let's rise against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rocks, on the height of his dwelling place, who says in his heart, Who will bring me down to earth? That's, uh, that's a rhetorical question. It's assumed that, that no one can bring him down. Um, though you make your home high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So here we have God answering um, his, uh, his rhetorical boast. Um, if, thieve, if thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh, how you will be ruined. Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, how Esau will be searched and his hidden treasures searched out. All the um, all the people allied with you will send you to the border, and the people at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. There is no understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, eliminate wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau, when your warriors will be filled with terror, Temen, so that everyone will be eliminated from the mountain of Esau by murder. Okay, so let's kind of... See what's going on here. First off, remember that this might have been right, this Obadiah might have been given right after Edom had already been destroyed. So it's just how you read the book. It could have been right before they were destroyed or right after they were destroyed. Um, either way, um, a large either the only audience or the la a large audience that Obadiah is speaking to are the Israelites who have had their homeland destroyed. So because of that, the audience is likely very cynical uh, about a word from God. Notice how uh, Obadiah goes into it. He specifically says, this is what the Lord God says concerning Edom. And then as he's going, he interrupts himself multiple times to bring up God again. We have heard a report from the Lord again. And then down here in verse um, 8, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, like an interrupting him there to remind you again who's speaking. Well, why would he go through all those to, to all those all those extra steps, um, they're 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 likely very cynical about a word from God. Um, you know, this is the guy who's abandoned us. You know, it seems like whenever we're in sin, we always blame God for <laughs> for how how we get punished. Um, so they're likely very angry at God. And uh, kind of the idea here um, in the Book of Obadiah is God kind of being angry at Esau. So you have this thing that happened where Israel disobeyed God. And God told them for years and years and years that this was not going to end well. They just would not listen. So finally, God raises up Babylon to punish them. But the problem is, is that they went too far. Babylon did not only what God, what God had, ex, had, had commanded Babylon to do, they also went above and beyond and treated Israel more than God had told them to. And then the nations around, they were harsher on Israel than God had said that said for them to be. So, you know, there's there's that element, but then also Esau is Israel's, you know, brother and they mistreated him in such a such a big way. The way I can um, help you to understand this is imagine the book of Obadiah being given to somebody who is in a church conflict. Okay? Israel is a person who did something wrong. They did something really really bad. And so God punished that person in the church. Meanwhile, um, another person in the church, whose name is Esau, um, 
they, they just love it. They eat it up. They finally got what they deserved. You know, haha. -ha. And so they take advantage of it. They're just having a good old time. They're talking with their be best friends, giving them a good clap on the shoulder. Hey, haha, -ha, they finally got what's coming to them. That, that kind of is a helpful, I think, um, uh, simile, um, metaphor uh, for, for kind of what's going on here. So God is not very happy about what Esau has done. And um, so not only have they gone above and beyond what God even wanted in the first place, but then they're supposed to be Israel's brother. Um, so is Esau very much so did take advantage of the situation for their prophet. Now you're going to say, so what exactly did Esau do? That's going to be explained later. Right now we're looking at the judgment itself, not the charge. So we'll have to come back to that in a week or two. Um, so verse 2 says, Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You are greatly despised. Um, so notice how he says here, some people use this as an argument for Obadiah speaking before Edom's destruction or after Edom's destruction. I don't think it has to be so... Um, I personally think that Obadiah is giving this prophecy right before Edom was destroyed. I don't think that this is grounds for saying that it was afterwards. Behold, I will make you small. So that's something that God's going to do among the nations. You are greatly despised. So the people who think that it is prophesied right after Edom's destruction bring that up. Well, you are greatly despised. This is something that has happened. You know, the, the full wrath of God has been poured out on you. But I don't really think that's what he's saying. I think what he's saying is this. Things were going well for you, and you knew that they were going well for you. But I'm going to make you small. Even now, at this very time, you are already despised. You think you're the cat's meow, that everybody likes you, that everything's going good for you. But what you don't realize is right now, at this very moment, your friends have already turned on you. You're already despised. This is about to go down. And I think that's what's happening. I could be wrong. Um, I know, um, what was his name? Block. Uh, Daniel, Daniel Block has strong feelings the other way. I just don't really see it. Um, so the 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 that's what that note there means. Will make um, you small versus you are despised. Um, the tables are turning right now. Uh, so that takes us to verse three. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rocks, on the heights of his dwelling place, who says in his heart, "Who will bring me down to earth?" Now the thing about pride is it oftentimes blinds us to what's happening. We, we, we get it in our heads how something is. We think that our, we're better than everybody else, that nobody can, excuse me, nobody can touch us. Everything's going fine, all this kind of stuff. It'll never happen to me, right? These things, they'll happen to other people. It'll never happen to me, you know. I'll never be the guy who messes up. Uh, I'll never cheat on my wife. I'll never have sleeping problems. Only Nicole will have sleeping problems. You know, it's never going to happen to me. You know, all these different things. And pride always tells us that. But What's interesting here is although God has previously in other prophets destroyed people because of their pride. He said that multiple times in the prophets. Here, Esau's pride is not what destroyed him. Pride wasn't the sin, but it was a blinding force to them. It was something that caused them to not see what was about to happen. See, he says here, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. Not the arrogance of your heart has caused me to destroy you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rock, on the heights of his dwelling place, who says in his heart, Who will bring me down to earth? Uh, they thought they were getting away clean, that nobody could catch them. They had a false sense of safety. This unfortunately happens many times, not just with people in the world. I'm talking about people in the church, too. We get this false uh, smugness, right? God will never let that happen to me. You know, I'm so much better than the sinners in the world. And, uh, you know, then something happens and we're completely wrecked. You know, we think, oh, well, it's okay because, okay, this person in the church, they're a pain. They're the problem. I'm the good guy. So I can I can mistreat them because they're the bad guy. I don't have to love the bad guy. And then God says, ho, 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 hold on. That's not what I said. And it's like, oh, but God, they're a pain. You don't know how many times God's dealt with me about this where there's be somebody in the church and they're just like, this person's such a pain in the butt. I just don't like them. And then God's like, now hold on, that's not what I told you to do. <laughs> and it's like, oh no, I have to change my heart, but they're the bad guy, God. Like somehow that's a, that gives me an excuse to have a bad attitude. So because they were prideful, because Esau was prideful, they opposed Israel. Well, we can do whatever we want. It's okay if we take advantage of Israel, if we profit from this. You know, God's punishing them anyways. They're just getting what they deserve. So what does it matter if I profit off of it? Um... 
basically Esau had this idea that they got out of jail free because Israel was being punished by God. That meant that they could take advantage of the situation and betray Israel, and they'd be totally in the clear because, hey, God's not punishing me. But what they didn't understand is that now, 50 years later, God is punishing them. Um, so the question becomes, which was first, Esau's pride or his smugness or his dwelling? Because it says here, the one who lives in the cleft of the rock on the height of his dwelling place who says in his heart. That brings up the question, so was he prideful and therefore he moved into the mountains? Or was he in the, lived in the mountains and so then he became prideful about his place in the mountains? Well, it doesn't really clarify. So just to give you an idea about – now, listen to these words, okay? The arrogance of your heart has deceived you. The one who lives in the clefts of the rocks and the heights of his dwelling place who says in his heart – who will bring me down to earth? Now, are you, did you guys hear that? Okay, just listen to that. Now, look at this picture. This is El Seir. Um, this is the capital of Edom. Um, not much there left, but if you zoom in, there actually are, are structures there. Um, but you see how mountainous that is. How would you like to have to march an army up that to try and defeat them? It, you, it seems pretty safe and secure, doesn't it? I mean, look at this. Here's another picture. That's the entrance there. You can see that structure there. Can you see it there on the bottom left-hand side of the picture? And then here's another picture from another angle right here. It's It seems pretty secure. And I'm sure you guys have heard of the city of Petra. Petra is 30 miles north. I'm sorry, 30 miles south of Seir. Um and uh, you've probably also heard of uh, the city of Basra. It's called uh, Bazira um, or something like that now. Basra. Right, but nowadays it's called um, something like Bazira or something like that. Anyways, ancient Basra. Um, ancient Basra is only three miles away. These are all places that you can see. Sorry, let me go back. You can see how they're how they're nestled in these real secure mountains. You know, so that kind of helps conjure now is seeing remembering these pictures now listen to this the arrogance of your heart has deceived you the one who lives in the clefts of the rock on the height of his dwelling place who says in his heart who will bring me down to earth it fits now doesn't it yeah. but here we have also a very important play on words the capital of edom was called sela s-e-l-a not the same as sela in the psalms that's different the word means rock and it can be um, proper or improper. If it's proper, it is the city of Sila. If it's improper, it's simply a rocky, cliffy dwelling. Okay? So, in other words, he could be saying here, the arrogance of your heart is to you, the one who lives in the clefts of the rocks, or the one who lives in the city of Sila. So, that kind of gives you an idea. It's a little bit of a play on words there. Either way, um, Obadiah's audience fully understands what's being said, although we... Hundreds of years, thousands of years later, have have kind of lost a little bit of the plot. So that takes it to verse four. Though you make your home high like the eagle, though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, declares the Lord. So here, um, God has a little bit of a a little bit of a. Well, first off, it's an answer to his lofty, prideful question: Who's going to bring me down? God says, "Well, I'm going to." And he actually once again interrupts himself to say, "Declares the Lord again." Highlighting the fact that he's bringing a message from God. This is not something from his own uh, conscience. Um, however, notice that God said that he would bring them down. This is a reference to two things. First off, God would bring them down, bring their pride down, and also their location down. He's going to bring them down from the heights of their pride and bring them down from the heights of their mountains. Um, <laughs> and uh, in Jeremiah, I remember uh, two weeks ago, I show, I read you that. Part of Jeremiah, I think it was in verse in chapter like 14 or 15, where it was almost identical with Obadiah. Um, in that part, he emphasizes more God's role in um, in what what's about to happen. But in Obadiah, he emphasizes more the nation's role um, of coming against. So uh, I felt like it was maybe didn't need to be said, but I wanted to say it anyways. These are not things that Esau is literally saying. Esau is not literally saying, "Who will bring me down?" It's a way of um, of describing what is in somebody's heart, what attitude they have, by giving them statements that clearly explain. 
Okay, so you shouldn't imagine that you know Esau is literally standing there being like, "Who's gonna bring me down, sucker?" You know, it, it, it's it's not like that. It's just a way of writing to to kind of expound what's 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 happening. So verse five: If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, oh how you will be ruined! Would they not steal only until they had enough? If great pickers came to you, would, would they not leave some gleanings? Now, um, I didn't understand what this was saying, so I want to kind of spend a little bit, a little bit of time explaining this. This verse is broken up into two sections. There's if thieves came, and then if the great gatherers came. And this verse is broken up right in the middle by – he kind of in, interrupts himself, and he says this. Oh, how they will be ruined. This is uh, – well, I'll get to this in, in just a second. This is an interruption of the thought. So break it up in those two, two pieces, and it will be a lot easier to understand. So the idea here in, ver in the beginning, if thieves came to you, um, if robbers by night, oh, how, um, would they not steal only until they had, had they had enough? The idea here is that thieves only take the valuables and they leave. They don't stay there for the rest of the – just throughout the days bringing a U-Haul truck and just unloading your stuff. They come, they take the most valuable things, and then they leave. And um, and also here he talks about grape, grape pickers. If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? The idea here is that when a grape picker was going through a vineyard, they didn't waste their time picking up every single grape, right? They didn't grab the bad grapes. They didn't grab the one or two grapes that fell. You grab a whole – I don't think it's called a bushel. I'm not sure. But you grab the whole thing of, of grapes. It's like a it's like a vine. It has like a – it's a cluster. I think maybe that's what it's called, a cluster of grapes. It's this huge thing. You take that off, and while you're taking it off, some grapes fall. And that's what he's saying here. If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave some gleanings? Wouldn't there be some grapes left over? And what is his point in saying this? Well, I'll say that in just a second. Um, so then we get to verse 6, and I know that I didn't explain the whole, the whole, oh, how they will be ruined. We'll come back to that. Okay. For now, just see verse 5 is this. If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape pickers came to you, would they not leave until would they not leave some gleanings? So let's go to verse 6, and we'll go back to that part that interrupts verse 5. Um, if you'll notice, he switched now to saying Esau instead of to Edom. He opened it up talking about Edom, but here he uses Esau. Esau, once again, is synonymous with, with Edom. Esau is their uh, progenitor, their their uh, founder, I guess you could say. Like uh, like Jacob is is Israel's founder, or you know uh, Abraham is is you know the founder of the faith, or you know something like that. So you know Esau is is a way of saying the nation. The reason why he uses the word Esau instead of Edom is because he wants to wants to emphasize that they were they were, they were brothers and they have grossly betrayed that trust. So. Um, he does switch to Esau instead of Edom. Um, and so then that, that takes us to verse 6, which says, Oh, how Esau will be searched and his hidden treasures searched out. The way this sentence is constructed, this is what, what he's saying. Esau will be sought out and left desolate. And this is a contrast to the thieves in verse 5 where it says, Wouldn't they, wouldn't they steal only until they had enough? That's not what's going to happen to Esau. They're going to be completely left desolate. The, they're not, it's not going to be a situation where the robbers come in and steal the most valuables. They'll be left with nothing, completely desolate. If if, if thieves had come, they probably had had left uh, had more left over than what's about to happen. Um, so that contrasts with the with the thieves of verse five. Um, verse six relates with five is what I'm saying. And then right here, that and so we'll go back to verse five. Okay, so verse five: If thieves came to you, if robbers by night, right here is an interruption. Oh, how you will be ruined. And this is this is um, kind of a um, – it, it doesn't fit here. It's a purposeful interruption to the flow of thought. He's saying something, and you're like, okay, thieves, gotcha. Oh, how they will be ruined. It's like, well, why would you say that? This is an exclamation of dismay. It's, it, it's, it's, it's something that this is not bringing the prophet any joy. He's not happy about this. He's saying, oh, boy, you guys don't even realize what's happening. This is This is a disaster. You know, sometimes we have it in our head that that some of the prophets were sitting there gloating like, ha ha ha, take that, you sinners. But that's definitely not what's happening to Obadiah. And so, if you look, we'll look over to Job, um, chapter thirty-one. I think that this this little thing that Job says really highlights what's going on uh, for the prophet Obadiah. Because remember, he's he's saying, okay, so if thieves have done this, if grape gather, oh, you're going to be just so destroyed. This is going to be so bad for you. They wouldn't they have left something? See what I mean? It's a way of really emphasizing 
the drama of what's about to happen. This isn't something that's happening lightly. So Job 31, 29 through 30 says this. Have I rejoiced at the misfortune of my enemy or become excited when evil found him? No, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for his life and a curse. Have you ever done that? Somebody really pissed you off, or really hurt your feelings, and you say, God, punish them. Remember what they did. Bring trouble on their house. And Job is saying, I never did that. I never did that, and that's exactly what's going on here with Obadiah. He's not happy about what's happening. And that, once again, remember Obadiah draws a lot of inspiration from the book of Ezekiel. That's something that Ezekiel prophesied in one of his prophecies is God's, God's speaking. He says, I don't enjoy the destruction of the wicked. This is not something that brings me great joy. And so here Obadiah, being greatly influenced by Ezekiel, is prophesying and points out that this is not this is not a thing of joy. Um so then that takes us back down to verse 7. All the people allied with you will send you to the border, and the people at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. This sounds like a long, disconnected verse. Let me break it down. It's set into two, into three sets of two. Okay, All the people allied with you, the people at peace with you, they who eat your bread. This is what, the, this is what that people who is the same group of people okay, just... It explains it three times. That same group of people will do three things. We'll send you to the border. We'll deceive you and overpower you. We'll set an ambush for you. Okay, so now that you get the big picture, two, three sets of two, well, let's read the whole thing. All the people allied with you will send you to the border. And the people at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They who eat your bread will set an ambush for you. Now it's not, it doesn't seem so disconnected, does it? So... Uh, what's going on here? Well, let's let's break this down. Okay, the first off is these people are going to be doing something. So who are the? These are their allies. They're, they're someone who they have signed a treaty with. Um, supposedly they're going to be their helpers, and they are people who they are trusting that this is not this this is going to go well for them. But what's actually going to happen is first off they will send you to the border. What does that mean? It means that when trouble comes on Esau. They're not. They're not going to offer them asylum. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry about that. They're not going to offer them asylum. They're going to kick them out to the border. Okay, that's the first thing they're going to do. Well, they'll send you to the border. The second thing, deceive you and overpower you. They will fight against them. They'll take advantage of them. They're not going to. They're not going to be their salvation or their or their you know savior. Or what's what's another word for that? Um, well, you get what I'm saying, anyways. Uh, and they're not going to. They're not going to help them. They're going to actually hurt them. And then it says here, the last thing that it mentions, they will set an ambush for you. Now, this is a two-part. Uh, first off, um, they will send them back to their pursuers, the people who are who are invading them. So in other words, they're going to send them back to the trap. And then uh, the, other, the other way that this can be understood is that they are going to ensnare them, hunt them down like an animal in their own land and catch them. And give them up to the pursuers. So either way, they're going to be in between a rock and a hard place. They're going to be caught either in their homeland or in this place that they fled to and given back to the people who, are, who have attacked them. So, um, And also, verse 7 is a contrast to the grape gatherers. So in verse 5, it says, if grape pickers came to you, wouldn't they leave some gleanings? Wouldn't there be some left over? That contrasts with verse 7. All the people, they're going to send you to the border. They'll deceive you and overpower you. They will set an ambush for you. So verse five, verse 6, how Esau will be searched and his hidden treasure searched out, that relates back to the thieves. And this verse here, all the people odd with you, they're going to send you to the border. That relates back to the great gatherers. So um, let's see. So in other words, Esau, they will leave no gleanings from Esau. Esau will be completely destroyed. And actually, that is what happened. Um, Esau was, destro was destroyed here, and uh, they never became a, um, a power again. There was a province that came there in the time of, of Jesus called Idumea, uh, but that was not really a sovereign nation. That was a, a province. Um, I believe, if I remember correctly, Herod the Great was actually an Edomite, um, but Edomite power once again never surfaced again. Um, and the city of Petra... Uh, was actually inhabited later, not by Edomites, by, by, but by Nabataeans, who were an Arabic people, um, a nomadic people. And uh, so, okay. So, let's see. I'm just going to read through these notes, make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, Esau's allies gave them a false, a false hope. 
They were supposed to not attack each other because they were in a treaty with them. And they were supposed to help each other in battle. But in that way, it was a false hope because neither of those things happened. They did attack them and they didn't help them. Um, they are profiting from taking advantage of them, forcing them against their will, something that happened to to Israel. So this is kind of like, um, actually, it's it's perfectly them getting exactly what they dished out would be a way of saying that. Okay, so I said all that. So if you notice here, there's a little bit of almost irony here. Those who eat your bread, when they made a covenant of peace, a treaty, as we would call it by, by modern, they, they would break bread together. They would have a, a, a meal together. And uh, it's, kind of, it's kind of funny here because he's talking about how they're going to eat their bread together, but these are the same people who are going to take advantage of them. So it's like to, 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 to push the church example. Okay, you go to church with somebody, you've been you've been sharing your bread with them. You've been you've gotten close with these people at church, right? And um, they're the same people who stab you in the back. And you see what I mean? That maybe that helps you kind of understand what's going on here for Esau. This is this is something that's a very big disaster. Um, a lot of irony there. Um, they will be betrayed. See, it was fun for Esau when they had the cards, when when they ha held all the cards. It was fun for them. Because it was like, oh, we get to profit from Israel. But once the tables had turned, well, it wasn't so great anymore. Um, it wasn't so funny. So Esau's response to this. What, what's what's Esau's response to you know how Esau is going to be searched by these people and left with nothing? How their allies are going to leave them? What's the response? The very last line of verse 7. There is no understanding in him. In other words, he's completely ignorant of it. He's dumbfounded. He's like, what? So then verse 8, 9, and 10 kind of have this building climax. 8's what God's going to do. 9's like the the effect of what's God, what God's going to do. And then that leads us into 10. And we'll look at verse 10 starting next week. So don't worry about that. Um, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, eliminate wise men from Edom and understanding from the mountain of Esau? So here we have a two-pronged attack from God. First off, God will destroy the wise people, maybe by giving them foolishness instead of wisdom maybe by causing them to die maybe, i don't know it doesn't really elaborate but somehow god is going to destroy them and then here's the second prong of this attack from god he's also going to destroy wisdom itself from edom he's attacking the idea of wisdom in edom now this is kind of interesting um so the basic idea here is that they are not going to have a solution to the crisis that god is that is coming so here in the bible we not only see god as the source of wisdom we also see him in obadiah as the preventer of wisdom kind of kind of a kind of a big thing that god not only gives wisdom but he also withholds it so that takes us to verse nine and we're about done i think this is the very last slide um Uh, mountain of Esau, that's just, once again, a reference to Esau. We said in verse 8, Will I not on that day, declares the Lord. Once again, he interrupts himself to say, declares the Lord. Eliminate wise men from Edom. See there he says Edom. But then here he says, An understanding from the mountain of Esau. Mountain of Esau is in a real place. It's just a way of saying the mountain that they live on. Um, Mount Seir, or, or like I said, the capital, Selah. So, okay, all right. Um... So that takes us to verse 9. Then your warriors will be filled with terror. Temen. We have this new name here, which shouldn't really um, shouldn't really surprise us that much. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. It can be a person, as we see in the book of Genesis. But here the context obviously shows it's a geographic location, which mirrors where he used Edom here in verse 8, now he uses Temen in verse 9. And I'll explain that in just a minute. When your warriors will be filled with terror, Temen, so that everyone will be eliminated from the mountain of Esau by murder. So what I thought was ha – what he, what he was saying was – I thought he was saying that God's going to kill the wise and wisdom, and therefore the warriors will be filled with terror. But I don't think that's actually what he's saying. The warriors don't know how to organize and defend themselves, and they will be overcome with fear, and no one will be able to give them a winning strategy because the wise people have – they're gone. So their warriors don't stand a chance. There's no cohesion. There's no people uniting. There's there's no there's no way out. They're just terrified. So that brings up the question: Why the panic? Well, there's a few things that I think, and I'm gonna um, end on what I think is the most likely answer to why the warriors suddenly have this panic. I mean, they're warriors. They're surely used to fighting and slaughter. 
Um, God's removal of wisdom caused panic. They, they're not they're not wise. They just kind of you know um, God basically caused a spirit of stupor as a way of saying a spirit of sleepiness, a spirit of just um, not understanding. Okay, that could have happened. For instance, we see um, people who are excessively prideful, like Pharaoh in the book of Exodus, where God caused him to be more prideful. Okay, well, you know, that could be a thing. Um, maybe they're panicked because there's no wise people. There's no one to bring them together. Maybe they're, maybe they're panicked because of the coming destruction or the prophecies that were given. Uh, maybe it's a curse from God. What I think is more likely is I think this is a climax of all the things that he said before. Basically, in light of the their allies betraying them and then god personally attacking them by 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 sifting out the wise people i think that i think he's saying that that's going to cause the panic that's just it's just a climax of all these different things have happened like we were talking about all those all those stressors just mounted up to cause uh, an, an event that was just like ah and I, I think that's what he's saying i could be wrong um so if you notice there i and i already pointed out once it says then, which means at that time, not necessarily because of. So, in other words, it, the panic isn't necessarily a direct result from the wisdom being gone, which is why I think that it's as a climax of all the stressors adding up. Um, okay, and so then that takes us to the very last thing I want to point out, and that's because I already brought it up. Um, the word temen there. Temen, it, let me just make this a long story short, okay? Temen basically means the northern region of Edom. That's a really easy way of saying it's not a specific city. It's just the northern region of Edom. I think that's the simplest way I can say that. I could bring up all kinds of different things to highlight that. I don't think it's necessary. I think I can just say that and move on. Uh, so next week, um, we will start in verse 10, which is actually the ending of this section, and we'll go through the charge. Now that we've gotten through the judgment, what's going to happen to Esau? Now next week, we'll look at the, the charge. What did they do that's so bad? So, okay, any questions? No questions whatsoever. Awesome.